All right, you guys, welcome back to another video lesson from ICU Advantage. In this lesson here, we are going to be taking a look at the different advanced modes of ventilation that we have available to offer to our patients. And hopefully this lesson is going to build on the previous couple lessons that we talked about to really round out your understanding of our options available to our patients for mechanical ventilation. Before we get too far along, let me introduce myself. My name is Eddie Watson, and this is ICU Advantage. And my goal here with ICU Advantage is to really take these complex critical care topics and really break them down and make them easy to understand for you guys. I hope that I'm able to do just that, and perhaps if I have, by the end of this lesson, I'll have earned a subscription from you. If you do, make sure you hit that bell icon, though, and select all notifications. That way you'll never miss out on a new lesson. Once again, another quick shout out to Joe with Respiratory Coach, who was very helpful in reviewing over the material for these past few lessons. He's got an awesome channel here on YouTube covering everything related to respiratory therapy. So if you guys haven't already gone on over there, make sure and subscribe to his channel and check out his awesome content over there. All right, so getting in here, in the previous lesson, I, I talked about some of the, the basic modes of ventilation that we had available to us and, and the ones that we most often are going to be using in our patient. In this particular lesson, though, I'm going to be doing a really quick overview of some of the many advanced modes of ventilation that are out there. Now, these modes go from being only slightly different from one another to some modes that are on a whole different level than especially the, the basic modes that we talked about in the last lesson. For this lesson, I'm going to intentionally not go too into depth into each one of these, uh, but really more provide an overview of how these modes operate. One, to give you that basic overview understanding of what they are and kind of how they work. Uh, and then two, because I'm at some point in the future going to probably do some more in-depth lessons related to some of these particular modes. So again, the point of this lesson, give you that good, broad overview of what these modes are. So in order to move forward, though, I do want to revisit the topic of volume versus pressure control, as this particular difference is often at the heart of the difference between some of these advanced modes of ventilation. All right, so the first thing that's important here is we need to understand about this compliance equation. And I'm sure that you guys have heard this term before, but this compliance is really the ease or ability of, in this particular case, our lungs to expand and contract. So in order to determine what our patient's compliance is, we're going to look at the change in volume over the change in pressure. And the point of this isn't to have you guys memorize this equation, but to understand the concept of what's actually happening here. And what this is basically telling us is if we can control one of these variables, either volume or pressure, then the other one is going to be determined by what our patient's compliance is. I hope that makes sense, and really the takeaway here is, let's say we have our patient in volume control, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be setting the volume, and that's going to be constant, and therefore, depending on our patient's lung compliance, the pressure that's required to reach that volume is going to vary, that's going to be our variable. And if you think about it, if you have really stiff lungs, it's going to take more pressure in order to inflate those lungs with that same volume of air versus if they're more compliant, it's going to take much less pressure in order to do that. Now, the reverse is also true here where in pressure control ventilation, here we're actually setting the pressure, which is going to be our constant, and then the volume is what's going to be variable. And so again, the intuition for that is if we have a set pressure that we're working with, if our lungs are not very compliant, hard to expand, we're not going to get as much volume for that same amount of pressure that we apply. Whereas if those lungs are more compliant, they're going to expand more easily and we're going to see larger volumes. And this is really at the heart of the, the differences between our volume and pressure control is what we're in control of, what we're setting, and then what for our patient is going to be determined based on their compliance. So here I want to take a look at our volume control. Now, here again, we have the tidal volume that is set, and then the vent is going to adjust the pressure needed to ensure that we have the proper flow to achieve the volume that we want. So here, the more pressure that's used to create more flow, and thus is going to deliver a greater volume. And on the opposite side, therefore, less pressure that we use is going to decrease flow and reduce the volume that's delivered. Hopefully this is well understood by you guys, and really you can think of it like a balloon. If you want to fill the balloon more, you're typically going to blow harder with more air. It's kind of the same concept here. The more pressure that we put into our patient's lungs, the more flow of air is going to go in there, and thus the larger tidal volume. So up next, let's talk about pressure control. 
And here I'm going to talk about just straight pressure control. There are some different variations of this that we're going to talk about here in a minute. But in basic pressure control, we're going to set a frequency, an FiO2, and a PEEP. Now, where this is different from volume control is here we're going to set an inspiratory pressure and an inspiratory time. And so what's happening here is the vent is going to switch from what our PEEP is set at to what our inspiratory pressure is set at, and it's going to hold that pressure for the inspiratory time that we set, at which point it's going to drop back down to our PEEP. To hopefully help to make this make sense, let me try to draw a little graph here. And let's say in this instance we have a PEEP of 5 and an inspiratory pressure of 20. Here the vent is going to be holding at our PEEP, and then when it's time for the next breath, it's going to increase the pressure to our inspiratory pressure, and it's going to hold it for the inspiratory time, at which point it's going to drop back down to our PEEP and hold there until it's time for the next breath and do it all again. And if you think about it, our frequency is going to be set measuring from this point here to this point here. So as a quick example, if we had a frequency or respiratory rate of 10, we know that the time here would be six seconds between each breath. And so if we had an inspiratory time of, let's say, one second, then what this means is that once our vent comes back to CPAP, we're going to have five more seconds until another breath is initiated. And again, these are the controlled breaths. So essentially, really, we can think about this is the vent is just cycling between these two pressures. It's going from our PEEP to our inspiratory pressure, back to our PEEP, back to our inspiratory pressure, and it just repeats this over and over based on the frequency and the hold time, that inspiratory time that we've set. Now again, hopefully this makes sense, but as a result, when our pressure is higher, air is going to move into our patient's lungs and volume is going to be delivered. As the pressure drops back to our PEEP, this is going to cause pressure to be higher in the lungs and therefore air is going to leave our patient's lungs, providing them the expiration. And once again, looking back at our compliance equation, for any given pressure that we have set, our patient's volume is going to be determined by their lung compliance. And so ultimately, if we're wanting to increase the volume that our patient is getting, we're going to need to increase the pressure in order to achieve that. So it's a little backwards in how we have to think about it because we're not directly controlling that volume that we're setting. We're changing the pressure, which will determine how much volume the patient will get. Obviously, the more volume they get, this is going to impact our patient's ventilation and therefore is going to have an effect on our CO2 levels. All right, hopefully the difference between these two modes makes sense for you guys because they're starkly different from one another. But really, if you think about it, we're doing the same thing. And that's, and that's one of the hardest things for people to realize sometimes is at its most fundamental level, all the vent is doing is moving air in and moving air out. It's just a matter of how we set things in order for that air to move in and out. Obviously, no matter what we do, it's going to require pressure because these are positive pressure ventilators. It's going to require an amount of pressure in order to move the air into our patient's lungs. But the key differences are those little settings, like in these simple modes, are we setting the volume that we want them to get and we're okay with different amounts of pressure as long as we get that same volume? Or are we more worried about the pressure that's being set and we're okay if we have a difference in volume as long as we're controlling that pressure? So there definitely is a time and a place for pretty much all of these modes that we're going to talk about in this lesson. And perhaps I'll save that information for future lessons, diving a little bit deeper into some of these modes. But the important takeaway is it's just a matter of what we're setting, but the underlying mechanics of what's happening is, is really essentially the same. It's just going about a different way. All right, so let's move on from here and talk about something called dual modes of ventilation. So we just talked about the differences between volume and pressure, but sometimes we can have modes of ventilation that actually are a combination of both. Both a volume and a pressure is what we're going to be setting in these modes. Now there are several different modes of ventilation that really would fall in this category, but there's really one popular mode that I want to talk about here, and it's something called Pressure Regulated Volume Control, or PRVC. So take a minute and just think about this one. Pressure Regulated volume control. Hopefully if you think about it for a minute it will start to kind of make sense but this is a dual mode in which we're going to be operating like pressure control but ensuring that we have a set volume achieved. 
So we really can think of this like a smart vent that's going to be taking feedback and making adjustments based on that. And so you might be wondering, okay, well, how is this any different than volume control? Because that's essentially what's happening there. Well, here, instead of those adjustments happening on the fly in real time throughout the course of a single breath, the adjustments in PRVC are made slowly over time. Now the settings that you're going to see with PRVC are going to look very similar to volume control. So here we're going to have a frequency, an FiO2, and a PEEP, as well as something that we call a target volume. And this target volume is what's going to be different from our volume control. Here we're basically saying this is the goal for the volume that we want to achieve, instead of explicitly stating you must give this volume. And so in order to do this, what happens is when we first start our patients on this mode is the vent is going to initially have a test volume breath. And it's going to use this to determine the pressures that are going and the ideal amount of compliance that our patient has going on. From there, it's going to figure out a pressure to operate with. And it's going to give a pressure controlled breath at that particular pressure setting. And then what it's going to do is it's going to look at and determine what volume was delivered with that pressure. And from there, it's going to adjust the pressure up and down for the next few breaths gradually until we reach that targeted volume that we're looking to have achieved. So again, let's go ahead and draw this out on a graph to hopefully have this make some more sense for you guys. So here again, let's say we have a peep that's set at 5. And after giving that initial volume breath, the vent believes it needs to provide a pressure of 20. Therefore, we're going to see a inspiratory pressure of 20. Now let's say that we had a targeted tidal volume of 500. And with this particular breath, let's say our volume was 450. And so now what we're going to see the vent do is from breath to breath, we're going to see it slowly increasing that inspiratory pressure until eventually we reach the level, like let's say in this example, it's 25 to where we get the volume that we have set as our targeted volume. And so then now that we have an inspiratory pressure of 25, the vent is just going to continue to kind of operate at this level unless things begin to change with our patient's compliance. So let's say our lungs start improving and our patient's compliance starts getting better, then we're going to start to see a reduced pressure necessary in order to achieve that same target volume. So now in this case, we see that we've given too large of a volume, and so the vent is going to slowly start working to reduce that inspiratory pressure to bring us back down to the pressure level that we need to achieve again that same target volume of 500. So this is a really good mode if you want to have the vent operating in a pressure control, but you still at the same time want to ensure that you're getting enough volume for your patient. This way you're not having to constantly monitor what those volumes are as the vent is going to be adjusting and changing and doing that stuff for you. All right, let's move on to the next mode here. And this is going to be one that we call airway pressure release ventilation or APRV. Now here the name is not going to be as intuitive. Essentially APRV is a form of pressure control ventilation. And so what's going to happen in this mode here is the vent is going to hold prolonged periods of high pressure with very short periods of what we call a release of pressure. And this is typically back down to atmospheric pressure. And so at its basic fundamental, this is really kind of a form of CPAP with really high pressures. So if you remember from my lesson on non-invasive ventilation, I'm going to link to it up above if you haven't watched it. That CPAP basically just has one pressure set and it holds that pressure the entire time with the goal of supporting and stenting and opening alveoli to be available to aid in our patient's oxygenation. And so as you can probably figure is APRV is going to be extremely good at recruiting those collapsed alveoli and keeping them open due to having a very high mean airway pressure. So essentially what we're doing here is we're holding a high level of pressure in the lungs, causing that high mean airway pressure, and then having a very short release of that pressure. This pressure release is what's going to help with our CO2 removal. So again, let me kind of graph this out to, again, hope to explain what's happening here. Now, in order to understand what's happening in this graph, you have to understand some of the settings that we have. In this mode, we still set an FiO2, but the rest of the settings that we have here are completely different than anything that we've really talked about up to this point. And they're kind of backwards when we start to think about 
some of the normal things that we're, we're looking to set and control. And with this, we actually technically don't directly set a frequency or a respiratory rate with this. And so what happens here is there's four other primary settings, something we call P high and P low, T high and T low. And so as you can probably figure out, P high and P low are for our pressure. So we have a high pressure and a low pressure. And then T high is referring to time. So we have a time at our high pressure and a time at our low pressure. And so what's going to happen is the vent is going to switch to our high pressure and it's going to hold that for the time that we have set for T high. Then it's going to release down to our low pressure, which typically we have this set at zero, and it's going to hold that pressure for the amount of time that we have set for the low pressure. And this is usually something really short, like a half a second. So let me kind of show that what that looks like here on the graph. So here we're going to hold our high pressure, and then we're going to quickly drop down to zero and then come back and hold at our high pressure and again quickly release and hold and quickly release and hold and this is what our vent is doing in APRV. Now obviously during this time here we have our volume going in and our volume is going out for expiration here in those release modes and you might be wondering in the past we've talked about not ever wanting to have a peep of zero because of not wanting our patient's intrathoracic pressure to drop to zero. Well, what actually happens here is because that release time is so short, even though the pressure is set at zero, the pressure usually only ends up reaching down to about what we would normally have a peep set at before it's time to switch back to our high pressure. This is something that we refer to as auto peep. So as long as you keep that T low very short, you're never going to end up reaching true zero. Now again, if you remember, we don't have a frequency set here, but we do have our T high and our T low. This here and this here. And so really the time from here to here is just a combination of both our T high and our T low. So for instance, again, if we had a T high of 5.5 seconds and a T low of 0.5 seconds, we'd have a total cycle time of six seconds, which just like in our previous example, this would give us a respiratory rate of 10. And so ultimately then, if you needed to blow off more CO2 for your patient, you're going to want a faster respiratory rate. Then you're going to look to shorten that total cycle time so that you have more cycles of respiration happening. So like I said, it's really kind of backwards from how we normally think about things. We think, I just want to increase my respiratory rate. I should be able to set that. But in APRV, it's not quite that easy. You have to kind of adjust some of these other numbers to achieve what you want to achieve. Same goes for your volume. If you want to increase or decrease your volume, you're going to have to adjust your pressure, your P high, in order to change the volume that your patient is getting. Now, one of the advantages to APRV, because you might be looking at this thinking this is quite uncomfortable for someone to be holding with this much pressure, and certainly Anecdotally, it can be if our pressures are very high, but one of the nice advantages of, of APRV is that it actually doesn't prevent our patient from still taking spontaneous breaths. So all along the way, if they want to take these spontaneous breaths, they can, and they're able to, so they still have that ability to quote-unquote breathe while we're still maintaining this high-pressure, low-pressure release with APRV. And in fact, the spontaneous breathing of our patient is, is really pretty important because as you can see here, we have this pretty low, pretty short amount of time for exhalation. And so we oftentimes will find in our patients who aren't spontaneously breathing that that's just not enough time on its own to release all of the CO2. And so we start to see an accumulation of CO2 in these patients. So APRV is a fantastic pressure control mode of ventilation. It's really great in patients in which we want to really provide a lot of support to help in their oxygenation. So think about patients who are in ARDS, where one, we don't want to be putting too much pressure into the lungs, but we also are having a really hard time achieving our gas exchange. And so by having this high mean airway pressure in the lungs, we're really going to open up those alveoli and it's really going to help with oxygenation in these patients. All right, and so let's move on here and talk real quickly about something that we call high frequency oscillatory ventilation 
or HFOV. So the oscillators are actually something that's used a lot in babies in the NICU, but this is something that you can also see in adults. And so the goal here with the oscillator is to maintain that high mean airway pressure similar to what the goal was with APRV. Again, by having the high mean airway pressure, we're going to keep the alveoli open to improve gas exchange. The thing that's really unique and special about the oscillator is here we're actually going to have a very high frequency that's set for our patient's frequency. And in fact, when we're setting this frequency, we set it in a measurement called hertz. And typically, we're going to be setting this from 4 to 7 hertz. Now you might be wondering what the heck a hertz is, and really a hertz is the same thing as 60 oscillations per minute. So if you think about it, if we're setting our patients with a hertz of 4 to 7, each one of those is 60 oscillations. So really we're setting a respiratory rate that's anywhere from 240 to 420, which is just mind-blowing to think about. As a result of this, though, we tend to have very small tidal volumes, and in adults, we're seeing volumes usually of only 1 to 2 mLs. Now, having these small volumes is really going to help to limit that over-distension of the alveoli and preventing the volume trauma, much in the same way that we're doing that with APRV. And so, again, you can really just think of the oscillator as a much different way of achieving the same goal of having that high mean airway pressure that ultimately is going to make all the difference in the world for keeping alveoli open and really helping to oxygenate and to help with the gas exchange for our patients. Now there are other settings that we set on an oscillator such as the amplitude of the oscillations, the bias flow, uh, inspiratory time, but really understanding what these are uh, is beyond the scope of this lesson here. So I'm not going to talk about those. But here of late, there have been a lot of questions surrounding the oscillator and really whether there's any added benefit to the survivability of these patients, as opposed to if we were just to use other lung protective ventilator strategies such as APRV. All right, so we covered quite a few different modes to really give you guys a good overview of some of these different, more advanced modes of ventilation that you really might come across. Again, I far from covered all the different modes that are out there, but hopefully after understanding these modes that we talked about here with time and with some thought, you really should be able to understand and think through any new mode that you see, perhaps with just a little bit of help. Now, beyond what I've covered in this lesson as well as the last few lessons, there really is so much more that I didn't cover. There is so much more to understanding your patients, how they're tolerating what the vent is doing, but you can really learn so much about how your patient is doing from the measurements that you see on the vent. And there are many more settings that can really be changed and better optimized on there for your patients. And so what I highly suggest you do is if you ever think something's going on, grab your respiratory therapist and troubleshoot through things with them. If they have time and things aren't crazy and your patient is not crashing in that moment, ask them to take the time to explain what they're doing and more importantly why they're doing it in order to help you have a better understanding. And more often than not, they're going to be more than glad to do this. Now, a lot of those other settings aren't things that let's say a nurse is going to be going in there and adjusting, but it does help to have an understanding of what those things are and how they're possibly going to benefit your patient so that it might be something that you can suggest in the future. All right, you guys, I hope you enjoyed that lesson. Thank you so much for watching. Make sure and check out another one of my awesome lessons right here, uh, as well as subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. I hope you guys have a great day and I will see you in the next lesson.